Good morning. How are you guys all doing? Pretty good. Pretty nice winter we're having. Uh, or is it winter? I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it, but I'm okay with that. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Matthew 4. We're going to be in verses 18 through 22. Now, before we go to our verses and the message this morning, I've got an important uh, ministry offer to announce. Okay, it's a long-standing position in the church, so let me first describe the working conditions. It will involve long hours. That means weekends and a lot of overtime. Also, uh, it involves lots of travel, but you have to use the cheapest form of travel available, which means walking by foot, lots of walking, long distances, And there are no hotels. No hotels. You sleep when and where you can. Sometimes that means outside, exposed to the elements. And it will be dangerous. It's going to be dangerous. Uh, You'll be at risk from thieves, soldiers, public ridicule, maltreatment. Uh, The political climate is unsafe. And some of the things you need to do will put your life at risk. Now, there's no doubt in my mind right now that every veteran in here is thinking, I've already had that job in the military. However, guys, unlike our time in the military, this position has no compensation. There's no pay. There's no insurance, no pension fund, housing allowance or paid vacations. And as far as the qualifications needed, it requires complete obedience to your boss. You must deny yourself and obey him completely in everything, every detail. What do you think? Anybody here in a hurry to sign up and fill out an application and jump on the team here? Oh, but wait, wait, I forgot something. The benefits. Right? If you're looking at a position, you always want to know the benefits too, right? The benefits include learning face-to-face from the creator of the world, having a relationship with the king of kings, discovering real joy, having a new purpose in your life, and having eternal life. Now what do you think? In our verses today, we're going to meet four men, four men who recognize just how high the cost of that position would be, but more importantly, how rewarding the benefits were. And these four will be Jesus' first four disciples. And as we study their calling and their decision, hopefully we'll understand ourselves what it means for each of us as a disciple walking with Jesus Christ, what that means for our life. But first, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll open our Bibles. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have of opening your word, opening your word to see what instruction it has for us this morning. And as we explore the calling and decision of these four men, I pray we would truly understand what it means and what it entails for us to walk with him, to walk with Jesus, to trust in you, trust in your ways. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks for bringing our church family together here this morning for this time of worship. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's open God's Word. Let's read how Jesus calls these two sets of brothers to a lifelong relationship with a life-changing purpose. Matthew 4, verse 18, starting there. As he was walking, we're talking about Jesus here. So as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who is also called Peter. So you hear him called Simon, Simon Peter, Peter, Cephas even sometimes. 
just know that we're talking about the same guy there. So he saw two brothers, Simon and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, if you're reading this or hearing this for the very first time, initially, that, this just might sound like some kind of a casual invitation to go walk along the shore of Galilee with Jesus. You know, like he says, hey guys, let's go for a little walk here. You know, last September, Marianne and I were in Florida visiting some longtime friends. We were on the Gulf Coast there. And uh, the first day we arrived, they said, oh, you got to see the sunsets. That's what people do here. They go to see the sunset. So we go down there, and we're kind of getting caught up on things. And, and Marianne stands up, because, you know, we're kicking back there, relaxing. And, and she stands up, and she goes, hey, um, I'm going to go for a walk along the beach. Do you want to go with me, Brian? And being Brian, being who I am, <laughs> why are you guys laughing? <laughs> No, no, being, I was typical Brian. I'm sitting there lounging back, right? I'm like, well, where are we going? You know, I'm, are we going south? Are we going north? How far are we going to go? What does this walk involve? You know, and, and I'm, I make this whole big deal. And she looks at me and she just goes, Brian, I just want to walk up the beach, see the sunset, and then we'll come back. I go, oh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> well, you know, you kind of wonder if these guys had questions. I don't know, but, but for me, as I was writing this, I'm thinking, what is Jesus really inviting these guys to do? I mean, wouldn't you be wondering that? It's just me, huh? Okay. Well, that's part of what we want to explore in our verses this morning. What does it mean for us to walk with Jesus, to follow Him? And I believe that we're going to find walking with Jesus involves an active lifestyle. It involves letting him lead. And it will involve a closer relationship with him. So let's see about that. Now, somehow, someone, and this had to be a detail-oriented person, but somehow they figured out that in Jesus' earthly ministry, he walked about 3,150 miles. That's a pretty accurate estimate right there. Now, to put that in a different perspective, that's the equivalent of walking from one coast of the United States to the other coast. And not the shortest distance. We're talking like San Diego, California to Portland, Maine. That's about that distance right there. I can't verify this person's numbers, but I will say this. When you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus had an active life. So part of walking with Jesus involves an active lifestyle. He was constantly teaching, healing, traveling, or spending time praying. We even read of a time in Mark 3 where his family is very concerned about him because he's spending so much time serving others, that he's not even taking the time to eat properly. Long hours, lots of travel, and oh yeah, no hotels. You might recall Jesus' encounter with a guy out on the road one time who, who told him, he goes, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And at that point, Jesus then explained the sleeping arrangements that he would have to encounter. And he did so in Luke 9, verse 58. Foxes have dens, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus did not come to live a life of comfort or luxury. He didn't stay in five-star hotels. Much of the time, he didn't even have a decent pillow to lay his head on. 
when he called these four fishermen, he called them to a life of work. They would be active. They were going to be involved. Joining him was not going to be easy. You know, these guys were commercial fishermen, really, right? So they would get to see their catch. As his disciples, they wouldn't always be able to see the results of their efforts as they fished for people. So, walking with Jesus as his disciple involves an active lifestyle, but not just any old activity, not just busy work, his work. And we are to let him lead. Jesus had already begun his ministry, his calling, his path that was set. And then he called his disciples to join with him. Now think about it. These guys were in their comfort zone, weren't they? I mean, they were doing what they had learned all their lives, what they had been trained to do all their lives, what they were familiar with. And now they would be leaving all of that to venture into the unknown. And Scripture tells us, we read it twice, they did so immediately. Somehow, these guys understood that Jesus knew what he was doing. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to see that this wasn't their initial introduction to Jesus. But before we get there, I want us to look at what it means to be a disciple. The word disciple means one who follows someone for the purpose of learning, to become like the teacher. So Jesus invited these disciples to follow him. But that doesn't just mean to walk behind him. No, they were to learn from him, to go the way he's going, to do the things he does, uh, to act the way he acts. They were to walk side by side with Jesus in step with Jesus' plans. Now, several times, probably in their excitement, he had to remind them that his time had not yet come. And as we're going to read later on in our series here, when we get to Matthew 16, there's a time there where Jesus explains his soon-to-come suffering and death at the hands of the religious leaders of that day. And we're going to see that Peter, Peter takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him. In Matthew 16, 22, Peter tells him, he says, Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Then Jesus turned and he gives this very strong response to Peter in verse 23. He says, get behind me, Satan. Wow, words you do not want to hear from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's focus was more on what he wants Jesus to do as opposed to God's perfect plan for Jesus. If you think back a couple of weeks ago, when we were at the beginning of chapter 4, that's what Satan was trying to do in the wilderness with Jesus. Get him to do things his way and not God's way. So, even though this is a a very strong response from Jesus to Peter, it's appropriate. So, as disciples of Jesus ourselves, we must walk in step with Jesus. He is beside us. He's encouraging us. He's strengthening us. He's befriending us. But all the while, he is leading us. And he is going to accomplish his mission, the mission that God gave him to do, his father. So as we move on to our third point this morning, I just want to mention and I want to add that while they didn't know what they would face, the disciples, these guys knew who they would face it with. Scripture tells us that those four, 
knew who Jesus was. But now, now he's calling them to a closer relationship with him. One of the joys of preaching from the Gospel of Matthew is that we have the other Gospel accounts to compare with. And we read in those accounts how these four men are somewhat knowledgeable about Jesus. Now, it's in varying degrees, but they've already heard about him. For example, in Luke 5, verses 2 through 11, there are details there about Jesus' calling of these guys that are not in Matthew. In that passage, Jeter, uh, Jesus rather tells Peter to cast his nets into the sea. And then we read in Luke 5, verse 5, Peter's reply, or Simon's reply. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. We got skunked. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And that's a lot of work for them. Once they've cleaned their nets, put them away, now they've got to let them down. So he says, if you say so, I'll do that. Can you sense the tiredness and the frustration of Simon Peter there? Yet he does what Jesus asked him to do. And they end up with so many fish that their nets begin to break. And, and there's two boats there. They began to sink. They've got that many fish. At that point, Peter realizes that he is in the presence of a man of God. And his own personal shortfalls are now glaring to him. And then in verse 8 and 9, it says this, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me. Because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. So these guys all knew each other also. So the miraculous catch may have confirmed for Peter and the others that were there that Jesus was the Messiah. But Scripture gives us some other clues also. Did you notice at the beginning of verse 5, Peter called him Master? He wasn't a disciple yet at that point. But he still recognizes Jesus as some form of authority. Now why? Well, I think there's some clues in John 1, verses 35 through 42 there. There, they indicate that Peter likely knew Jesus through his brother Andrew. Andrew initially followed John the baptizer, who we know from our earlier studies, recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And Andrew introduces Peter to Jesus as the Messiah. He tells him, we have found the Messiah. Now, Andrew's regard for Jesus may have rubbed off on Peter, leading him to call Jesus Master. Or maybe Peter saw something in Jesus that that he admired and respected. Regardless, this fish-catching miracle appears to have given Peter that extra boost that he needed to follow Jesus as the Messiah once he was invited to do so. So Jesus' miracles likely played some role in convincing the disciples of his messianic identity. So why did? Why did the disciples drop everything and follow him? Was it the miracles? Was it out of respect for John the Baptist? Or something about Jesus' authority that just seemed to be worthy of honor and respect? We're not told. We're not told in in the Bible, in the verses. But all four chose to immediately sign up and begin a journey in which God used them profoundly. You see, being a disciple of Jesus is not just acquiring more information about him, but knowing Jesus and being transformed into his image. 
Jesus' call to the disciples wasn't to fill an open position in his workforce. It was to call them to a closer relationship with him. He didn't just teach them. He lived with them. He ate with them, talked with them, prayed with them. He corrected them. In other words, they did life together. And that changed them. It changed them. You know, later on, Jesus' disciples would be accused of turning the world upside down. That's quite a change. And when you walk with Jesus, your life will be changed. These guys, you know, they just started off as regular people, right? I mean, they weren't well-educated. That comment's made in Acts. They didn't have much influence. I mean, Jesus often found them arguing about who's the greatest, or sometimes they even asked silly questions Uh, They weren't the bravest group either. When Jesus was arrested in the garden, most of them ran away. And then Peter, Peter, who vowed to give his life for Jesus, denied him three times the night he was arrested. But as they walked with Jesus, as they observed his example, his model, his life, his prayers, teachings, their lives were transformed. These same men became pillars of the church. I want to close today with some answers to this question. What does it look like when we're walking with Jesus? The answers are going to look pretty familiar to you. (laughs) When we're walking with Jesus, we remain active in our faith by loving, caring, and serving others. And by the way, making more disciples along the way. Inviting others to come and walk with Jesus. But, we let Him lead. As we also walk by faith and live a life of hope in Him, it's about His ways. His actions. His words. Accomplishing His Father's mission, not our own. And as we're walking with Jesus, we grow closer to Him. We spend time with Him. We talk with Him. We listen to Him. Folks, He's inviting us to include Him in all of our decisions. Our faith in Him becomes who we are. And once you're walking that close with Him, there's no doubt in my mind, your life will be changed. Let's close in prayer. Father, sometimes this idea of change, or putting our trust in another, or allowing someone else to lead our lives, that can be intimidating. (laughs) It can be downright scary for some of us. But when we realize that the one who died for us, the one who is buried in a sealed tomb and rose again to defeat death on the third day, that he is the one asking us to follow him, we should long for him to lead us to do great things for him. To do a work in us, to transform us by doing life alongside us. I pray, Lord, you would find no reluctance on anyone's part here this morning to do so. May we jump at the chance to first and foremost trust him as our Lord and Savior and to let him guide us in the ways that grow your kingdom. Lord, may we remain active in our faith and continue to grow closer to you in the process. And we ask all this. In Jesus' name, amen.